Welcome to Helen Joseph Hospital. I'm Dr. Tom Boyles, and we're going to be shooting a series of videos to help you set up your hospital for infection control uh, with regard to COVID-19, the novel coronavirus. So infection control um, has three main pillars. Those are administrative, environmental, and personal protective equipment. There are multiple uh, videos and sources of information about personal protective equipment, or PPE, and we're not going to be covering those in detail here. What we'll be talking about in this video are the administrative and environmental measures that you may want to take to set up your hospital to provide effective infection and prevention and control during the coronavirus. So let's go and have a look at the first area, which is the queue of patients coming into the hospital. So it's important to have a single point of entry into the hospital. At Helen Joseph, we're lucky in that we've got this temporary tent set up outside our hospital, which we're going to be using. In your facility, you may have um, a different setup and you, you should adapt your, your personal setting. What we have here is the queuing mechanism. And we have decided to draw on the floor crosses, um, which are 1.5 meters apart. So the queue into the hospital patients are socially distanced from one another and we ask patients to stand on one cross and then move forward to the next cross when it becomes available. In your hospital you may choose to use circles, you may choose to use lines of tape as long as they're appropriately distanced. So we've got a short queue here and nobody in the queue right now but it can get extremely busy and it's important to have people managing the queue. It's important to instruct people to how to use the crosses and move from one to the next and it's important to ask people in the queue why they're here because there may be some services at the hospital which are not working due to coronavirus and you don't want somebody to wait in a queue for an hour just to get to the front to be told that their service is not happening. So um, an effective queue management system is important. Um, if you have the facility, uh, it's also very useful to have somebody with clinical experience to survey the queue because you may have people in the queue who are unwell um, and you may want to fast track them to the front of the queue into the system if you think that uh, it's not appropriate for them to stand for an hour in the queue. So queue management is very important. So we're now inside the first tent. Patients are coming from my right, from the queue that you saw before. And we've got lots of space in here. This is the symptom screening station. We've got five screeners. Uh, we've got five crosses on the floor. There's a large distance between the patients and there's a large distance between the patients and the screeners. The key function of this area is to divide patients into those who are symptomatic and therefore can spread coronavirus and patients who are asymptomatic. So the key questions being asked by the screeners of every patient are, do they have respiratory symptoms? Cough, fever, shortness of breath, sore throat. And because coronavirus is an acute condition, have those symptoms been present for less than 14 days? If a patient screens positive, they are split in one direction, which is through to the next tent. If they screen negative, they go in the other direction to the clean side of the hospital. So we've now moved across from the screening area where patients are divided by symptoms into the symptomatic area. You can see that we're fortunate in that we've got a big space. Um, we've got crosses on the chairs which are at least a meter and a half apart and we've got patients sitting widely separated from one another. In this area we'll have a variety of patients. Whilst they'll all be symptomatic, some will be sicker, some will be less sick. So the first thing we're going to do with these patients is to determine how sick they are. And we'll have a doctor and a nurse in this area, and we're going to do the minimum that we need to do to determine how sick the patient is. So we have decided to use a, a, a portable SATS probe so that we can work out the saturations on room air and the pulse and take a respiratory rate. And based on those parameters, we will decide whether a patient may require admission, in which case they will be fast-tracked inside the hospital 
or someone whom we feel is very unlikely to require admission to hospital and we'll be able to deal with their problem in the tent and send them on their way without coming into the hospital at all. Patients in the tent will include patients who came here for chronic medication. In that case, a doctor in this tent will um, write the prescription and we will use a, another member of staff, a runner, to go to the pharmacy to collect the medication, give it to the patient here and the patient can exit directly home. Other patients may have come here for uh, surgical procedures which are necessary, such as a change of a POP. Now, whilst ideally we would like to deal with that outside of the hospital, we're not in a position to do that. So while it's, this isn't an ideal situation, what we will do is we will give that patient a surgical mask, we will flag that patient as being positive, and they will have to proceed safely into the hospital to have that procedure um, using appropriate PPE and appropriate infection control measures, and they will then exit the hospital and go home. Patients who came to the hospital because of their symptoms but we do not feel are likely to need admission and are therefore not proceeding into the hospital will be assessed in this tent by a doctor. We are dividing those patients into those with HIV and those without based on their history. Patients without HIV by definition have got a cough less than two weeks, therefore do not meet the case definition for tuberculosis and they will be given symptomatic treatment, possibly an antibiotic. Um, they will be given a leaflet about COVID and they will be asked to self-isolate at home. Patients with HIV and a cough less than two weeks meet the case definition for tuberculosis investigation and we do not want to miss TB cases during the COVID pandemic. Those patients will be assessed by a doctor and uh, they may be given an antibiotic according to uh, the doctor's opinion and they will be given a sputum jar and, a, and an NHLS form, a lab form They'll be asked to take that away to produce a sputum sample and we will be asking a relative to take that sputum sample to the nearest clinic with the form. So we're now in the third area of our tent and we're still outside the hospital and this is our testing area. Testing criteria change but any patient who is likely to go home but meets the, whatever the current criteria are for testing will be moved into this area safely away from everyone else because taking a test is a potentially aerosol producing procedure and they'll have their swab taken in a separate area before being escorted out of the tent and home to self-isolate. We're now inside the emergency department. This is where patients will be brought when they've been screened rapidly in the tent and found to be unstable and need further evaluation. These will be rapidly divided into two streams. Patients who clearly need admission, clearly need testing for COVID, will go directly to our COVID ward on the seventh floor. Patients where there is some doubt, where it may be that with further investigation, with blood tests, ECG, chest X-ray, we can either exclude COVID or we may be able to send the patient home, will be assessed in this area using strict infection prevention control measures. So we're currently in the emergency department on the ground floor. In our hospital, the ward that's been designated for investigation of COVID patients is on the seventh floor. And so we therefore need to get from the emergency department to the seventh floor without contaminating other, other areas. This will be different in different hospitals. But in our hospital, we've created a pathway through the hospital uh, with pieces of tape keeping people separated so that we can move a patient who's suspected of having COVID from the ground floor to the seventh floor. If you just follow me, I'll show you how we did it. So we're now up on the seventh floor. We've traveled through the hospital from the emergency department. And you can see that we've got red tape screening off areas of the hospital where uh, patients without COVID symptoms are and keeping them separate from the patients on this side who may or may not have COVID. So we're now up on the seventh floor and we're outside the ward which has been designated for patients under investigation for COVID. Right now there are no patients in the ward and we're able to go and film inside without compromising patient uh, identification and you'll see staff members without PPE. But once the ward is up and running, we've got a threshold on the floor that may not be crossed unless the staff member is in PPE. 
we have a donning room outside, we have a doffing room inside, and we have a separate marked pathway for leaving the unit. Let's go inside and have a look. So in this room, we've placed two beds. It's very important to realize that at this stage, we do not know which patients have COVID and which don't. And so in our two bedded room, we may have one patient with COVID, we may have one patient with tuberculosis. And it's therefore, the problem is that we don't know which is which. The turnaround time for tests is critical, but should that run into a couple of days, we'll have patients in a room together where one patient may have COVID and one may not, and the patient with TB is extremely vulnerable because that patient is already sick, and should they become infected with COVID, they're at high risk of dying. So, the, so it's extremely important to have very tight infection control measures between these patients in the room. So we've enacted a number of measures. Firstly, we've pushed the beds as far apart as we possibly can. Secondly, we're using the curtains in the room as a divider to divide the patients from one another. We are going to attempt to keep the patient in their bed space until we know definitively if they have COVID or not. So we're going to ask the patient not to leave their bed. We're going to attempt to feed them and do all toileting at the bed as best as possible. Now this room does have a shared bathroom but we're going to try very hard not to use that bathroom and only to use it in emergencies because it's absolutely vital that these two patients are not able to cross-infect each other. So it's not only important that the patients don't come into contact with each other and cross-infect each other, it's also important that a staff member dealing with one patient does not become contaminated and then transfer the infection to another patient. In an ideal world, a healthcare worker would completely remove their PPE after dealing with one patient, put on a full new set of PPE, moving to the next patient. In a low resource setting, that may not be possible, partly for time constraints and partly because of a lack of PPE. In order to get around that problem, we are suggesting that staff have minimal contact with patients. So for example, we will not be taking routine blood pressures on patients. We'll be taking blood pressures only when requested by a doctor, because that involves close contact with the patient, involves contaminating the blood pressure machine. We will be taking saturations, respiratory rate, pulse and temperature, because those require minimal contact. And it may be possible to only change a pair of gloves uh, while doing that for one patient and moving to the next patient. Should a staff member become fully contaminated, for example, they need to take a blood pressure, they need to move a patient in the bed, come into contact uh, with the bed space or the patient, they will need to have a full change of PPE before moving to the next patient. So what we are suggesting is that in that patient encounter, whether that be a nurse or a doctor, that they perform as many activities as possible at that time. So if a doctor is there and is taking blood and becoming contaminated, they can also take a set of observations if necessary, they can help the patient with, uh, with feeding while they're there, and so the patient will not need to be attended to um, so often. The doctor can then remove themselves and change their PPE. So we've now moved uh, from the ward for patients under investigation to the ward for patients with confirmed COVID. This is a four bed ward. You can see it's empty right now, but the PPE requirements will be slightly different and slightly less than they were under, in the patient under investigation ward. Because all patients will have COVID and therefore they were unable to infect each other and staff moving between patients will not be able to cross infect. So the key PPE requirement in this area will be for the patients not to infect the staff. Obviously there will be uh, standard precautions to prevent transmission of other pathogens between patients as you would on any other ward. Um, but the key is that uh, staff will need to protect themselves from becoming infected with COVID. So we're now in the clean area outside the PUI ward. 
and we're going to use this area to perform as many activities as we can to decrease the number of people going into the ward and the number of interactions on the ward. So for example, we're going to house x-rays outside the ward and the doctors that go into the ward to see the patients uh, will be able to take photographs of clinical notes, they'll then be able to clean their phone and bring it out and we'll be able to run consultant ward, round, ward rounds largely from the clean area. Um, the phone will be cleaned, they'll read the notes and then they'll delete the picture. So we've now moved to the non-COVID side of the hospital. These are the areas where patients and staff who don't have COVID symptoms are working and being cared for. It's important to realise that this is not a risk-free area when it comes to COVID transmission. One of the reasons COVID is so successful as a virus is that patient, people who are asymptomatic seem to be able to pass on the virus, be infected without showing symptoms and pass it on. It's therefore likely that at some point there will be staff members who are asymptomatic and patients with no COVID symptoms who are actually able to transmit the virus. This creates a huge risk because the patients on the ward by definition are very vulnerable and should they get COVID on top of whatever has brought them into hospital, there'll be a high risk of mortality. It's therefore absolutely vital that we redouble our efforts in standard infection prevention and control on non-COVID wards during this time. That means 100% adherence to hand hygiene, 100% adherence to appropriate PPE, and so that we avoid passing COVID between staff and patients and patients and staff, even on the non-COVID side of the hospital. So we've shown you how we've set up our hospital, Helen Joseph, in Hateng to cope with the COVID epidemic um, and how we've used administrative and environmental measures to protect patients and staff. It's important to, to note that your hospital or your healthcare facility will be different in terms of geography and you'll have different challenges. So your solutions will be slightly different. But the principles remain. It's important to have a single point of entry to the hospital, to manage the queue uh, with social distancing, to rapidly separate patients between those who are symptomatic and those who are asymptomatic. Patients who are asymptomatic should follow a different track through the hospital and not come into contact with the symptomatic patients. These need to be rapidly triaged and whenever possible, patients should be sent home to self-isolate. Patients entering the hospital um, will need to have further assessment. This may be in your emergency department or it may be uh, on your COVID ward where you move people rapidly. When patients are in a COVID ward and under investigation, i.e. the results are not known, it's absolutely vital to have strict IPC between patients because there will be patients up there who are COVID negative and have significant comorbidities such as tuberculosis. And if they become infected with COVID, uh, they're at high risk of dying. So you need to do everything you can to keep those patients separated until you have the COVID results. When patients are known to be positive, you'll be able to put them together and life will come, become a little bit more easy because patients will not be infecting each other with COVID. Of course, you need normal standard IPC measures and staff will need to be protected from one another. On the general wards, on the clean side of the hospital, it's important to realize that there are likely to be asymptomatic people with COVID. This may be patients with different conditions, it may be staff, or it may be visitors if visitors are allowed. So COVID transmission on the non-COVID part of the hospital is likely to be a reality. And it's vital that you have exemplary hand hygiene and other standard IPC precautions in the rest of the hospital for the duration of the COVID pandemic.